Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Open Mind Privacy Conference uh, 2020 edition. Um, my name is Peter Eckersley. It's a pleasure to join you here in cyberspace uh, in these strange times. I'm going to give a talk today about the crisis, the paradoxical crisis of privacy in the early 21st century and the role constructive or futile uh, of privacy enhancing technologies uh, in trying to get us out of that crisis. For those of you who, like me, uh, grew up in the 1990s, you may remember a time when the internet was not a fait accompli. It was a radical, drastic ambition. People were talking about building this crazy thing, a world wide web, a system of documents that would be linked together, hypertext for the whole planet. Um, and for the cypherpunks of that era, cyberpunks and cypherpunks, it was, it was a crazy time. We were trying to build something that seemed impossible. And then it succeeded. Uh, and the only price we paid was that we were left with a crazy privacy hangover. It was hard to get hypertext to work. We did, but it's even harder to get hyper hypertext to work with privacy. We didn't uh, quite succeed the first time around at doing that. So after the web was built, we all noticed that it wasn't delivering the privacy guarantees that we might have wanted to. We had lost the right to read in private. Um, firstly, because every web page you went to, and not every web page, but, but many of them, um, were festooned with do dozens of JavaScript tracking tags and one by one transparent GIF images that were causing our browsers to transmit information about our reading habits to these third party tracking companies. Some of them are uh, companies you know about, the Facebooks and Googles of the world, but others, th there were dozens of them that were th these companies that you had no idea existed, had no relationship with, but they knew everything about you and what you were reading because they had, uh, in some cases, cut a deal with the page you were on. In some cases, they cut a deal with someone who cut a deal with someone who cut a deal with the page you're on. And there was a chain of JavaScript includes following um, those relationships um, that wound up tracking you without consent. So what we'd gained was a World Wide Web, but what we'd lost was the right to read in private. Now, people did try to get it back with technology. Um, there were some really interesting projects, still are some really interesting projects, trying to figure out uh, how to offer a version of the web without getting it. Sends your traffic through three layers of uh, indirection, three hops around the internet, at each hop, a, a layer of onion encryption gets unwrapped and the message gets sent onto a new location. And nobody can see all the way across all the hops, which means that the IP address you use, which from the point of view of a tech company is essentially a street address um, or functions like one, isn't visible. That IP address isn't visible um, from your computer to the website you're visiting. Great. Tor also uses uh, a special browser that keeps all of the cookies and the traffic tracking JavaScript siloed uh, for each site so that they can't use those methods to link things you do on one page uh, or site to things you do on another site. Great. The problem is using Tor is uh, pretty inconvenient. It's relatively slow compared to browsing directly, and a growing number of websites are for various reasons, blocking people who show up wanting to read privately. And so we have a pretty deep unresolved tension there. So Tor is pretty good, but it's hard to use every day for everything. At EFF, we also started a project to try to offer people some protections for the right to read privately on a continuous day-to-day -day basis. But it turned out really the only way we could do that was by just blocking a lot of the trackers that you would see on pages that you visit. As it turns out, that also blocks almost all of the ads. Um, rather than trying to make a list of them, as some people were doing, we used a heuristic and machine learning approach where we tried to recognize the characteristics of the trackers that you were being exposed to and plot them by their behaviors. That worked. Uh, we were able to block a, a lot of tracking uh, on the web, maybe not all of it. Um, and we were able to get millions of people to install that browser extension, which was great. Um, it also inspired and always allied with a larger movement that was occurring at around the same time with other projects like Disconnect 
uh, and Brave, eventually even inspiring browsers like Firefox in private browsing mode and Safari um, to op offer some of these same kinds of protections structurally uh, in the browsers we use day to day. We were visiting and the things they included was one thing, but everything was also traveling over this HTTP protocol, which, which worked, but it was totally unencrypted. And that meant that anyone with access to parts of your network, whether that was your systems administrator or your ISP or your local government intelligence agency could read everything that you were sending, whether that was a username and a password or the contents of the messages you were exchanging or the pages you were going to, it was all an open book on the network. Now there was this protocol, HTTPS, that added a layer of encryption like an opaque pipe uh, between your browser and the site you were going to. Uh, and so, some sites used it, but it was quite rare. Uh, and none of the major services that you would use for sensitive communication really day to day uh, were encrypted. Uh, I remember there was a day uh, at EFF where I, I sat down with my colleague Seth Schoen and we made a list of things we could conceivably do to try to change that situation. Um, and at the time, the list looked really daunting. Uh, but one by one, we started doing the things on the list. Uh, and eventually, we actually managed to really drive the web from unencrypted HTTP to encrypted HTTPS. Along the way, we did things like badger the tech companies one by one saying, hey, you know, Google, can you offer a version of search that's, that works over HTTPS? And at first, there was some heel dragging, and then uh, some people came back and said, yes, actually, we can do this now. Um, the same conversation happened over and over with, with many of the platforms. Then we shipped browser extensions, uh, HTTPS everywhere and parts of the Tor browser that would automatically upgrade you to the more secure version when both insecure and secure were available. Um, and that started off as a small project and it ended up with a list of, of many thousands of sites that were being upgraded. We uh, tried to improve the security of the HTTPS connection itself. It depended on these strange organizations called certificate authorities. And when we looked to see, it turned out there were thousands of them um, run by all sorts of governments and all sorts of other entities. So lots of people were in a position to make a certificate for gmail.com that would convince your browser that that cryptographic key was gmail's key. Um, that situation persists, so it's, it's now considerably better in a lot of ways than it was when we first started looking. And lastly, and this was by far the biggest and most complicated project, we looked at the, the landscape and saw that there were millions of sites that didn't have an encrypted HTTPS version because it was just too hard to do. It, was, it cost money. You had to pay money every year for a certificate. And then you had to deal with this very bureaucratic and opaque system for proving that you control the domain. So we set out um, in a collaboration with people at Mozilla and the University of Michigan, some support from Akamai and Cisco to build a new certificate authority. Uh, that project became the Let's Encrypt project and also the CertBot project that uh, would let people get certificates and turn on HTTPS for free using an automated protocol. And uh, it took several years to get all of the, the pieces of that lined up. Uh, and then it took, um, once we launched it, it didn't take very long to get millions and then tens of millions of sites using it. Eventually, hundreds of millions of domain names started using Let's Encrypt. And so we were able to really kick the default um, of the web a long way from um, HTTP to HTTPS um, and make, while it's certainly not impossible for intelligence agencies and other surveillance actors to see what you're doing over HTTPS, they have ways. Um, they can't do that by default for everyone and the significant structural protections um, that we were able to get. But now let's turn to the present moment. The new thing that we're grappling with is not just the web. Um, it's not even just smartphones, these uh, very compelling and convenient objects that we carry in our pockets, which are festooned with dozens of different sensors and microphones and cameras and GPS units, uh, and which are reporting information from all of those things to all sorts of people. The thing that's, that's new and uh, that we're really grappling with is the growing success of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And those machine learning methods are making it possible uh, not only to collect millions of people's emails or millions of documents, but actually to begin starting to read them all. Um, 
to begin starting to make sense of them at scale. And as that's happening, um, new technologies are being built on top of that capability. Uh, and they're having somewhat destabilizing consequences. I think two of the most um, important examples that we're talking about are the Facebook recommendation engine, which is telling people, hey, pay attention to this, hey, pay attention to that story by your, from your friends, news article, um, whatever it is, based on a prediction of what you're going to engage with or the YouTube recommendation algorithm, which has a model of what people are likely to click on and watch, and which is leading them down all sorts of very diverse and sometimes troubling psychological paths. Um, so we're looking at the capability to start understanding the world with neural networks at scale. Uh, and there are all sorts of great, useful, constructive things we could do with that capability, but also there's a huge amount of power um, in who has, whoever's gonna be able to do it. And a huge question about whether it's appropriate for those tech companies to have so much data about us uh, in order to train their neural networks with. So that brings us to the, the, the privacy protections that we're seeing developed and talked about in the, the AI and machine learning space that range from uh, federated learning methods through differential privacy techniques, um, uh, secure multi-party uh, computation models, etc. Et this, this fancy family of fancy cryptographic privacy enhancing technologies and a question about what we can accomplish with them um, and what they're worth. But before I, I talk about that, I think we need to, to pause for a moment and ask, how do we score success or failure with privacy? In order to know if you're winning or losing, you need a theory of what privacy really is and why it matters. Uh, most legal and policy conversations about privacy begin with a framing about rights. Uh, they might go back to uh, Warren and Brandeis's uh, classic uh, law review article um, uh, advocating for a right to privacy uh, on the, the basis of a right to be left alone. Um, turns out back in the, the late 19th century, uh, one of the ways to get yourself appointed to the US Supreme Court was make up a new theory um, that there should be a right to privacy um, based on the, the right to be let alone. Uh, your co-author can be a, a, you know, a member of Boston High Society who's really mad about having um, uh, people's social lives published um, in the social pages of the, the local newspaper all the time uh, without permission. Um, you know, the, those were simpler times. How do we translate um, that into something more practical? more instrumentalist or consequentialist approach and say, well, what does privacy actually accomplish for people in different settings? And when you take that lens, uh, you see a really complicated picture. There are lots of different types of life situations that people can be in, lots of other actors or entities that they can need privacy from, lots of different stakes that can be in play from, well, it's annoying to have your privacy intruded on to it is a matter of life or death or liberty, whether you can prevent a certain uh, entity from knowing something about you. And what's common across, say, a journalist in Mexico trying to report on Los Narcos without facing uh, like mortal danger to her life, um, or a person um, who is, uh, you know, a teenager who is trying to prevent uh, their parents from uh, reading their diary or watching what they're doing on the web. Um, what's common across those people and, and really all of the settings in which we, we, we see privacy contested is that uh, privacy is functioning potentially, it's functioning well, as a shield against powerful social norms or institutions or individuals or, or laws that are ill-conceived um, that are that are trying to control, uh, intrude upon, harm, constrain people uh, in a way that ultimately we're not okay with. So the creation of privacy is a response to these situations in general, basically saying, we don't know how to, or it may not be feasible to intervene in each specific situation where there's an architecture of social control of some kind. Rather, let's carve out a very broad space and say, for example, if you're doing something that doesn't affect other people, then they don't ha shouldn't have an ability to know what you're doing.
uh, and that domain of activity should be yours uh, to, to use as you wish. Um, it's more subtle when uh, you get into speech questions, like do you have a right to speak in public anonymously or pseudonymously, or to report on people anonymously or pseudonymously, and those activities I think are specifically added to the, you know, privacy is the, the bundle of space where you don't affect others or where we believe that the effects you're having on others fall within certain um, forms that we wish to protect. Now, almost all of us uh, will view that trade-off around privacy as complicated. There are times when uh, people do things that are fundamentally antisocial or problematic in private, uh, and there is some uh, level of motivation to, to intrude for whatever reason we, we think that that behavior is antisocial. But we take this bargain as a whole, if we believe in privacy, and say it's worth it for us to live in a society where this carved out and protected space exists. And we're going to try to create it because we believe there will be lots of situations where there are bad laws or inadvisable social norms or corporations or governments that want to control people in ways that we would regret in hindsight. So with this theory of why privacy matters in hand, how to score it, we're in a better position to go back and ask which kinds of situations are privacy enhancing technologies going to work well in and where are they less likely to be productive? And there are a few things we notice pretty quickly uh, when we look in that direction. One is that where people are empowered and in a position to, to articulate the need for privacy, to, to push for it either by, by law or by technology, and where it's needed may not be the same places at all. In fact, the correlation between ability to, to get yourself privacy and need for it could be quite low. Uh, you know, lawyers in Boston in the late 19th century and computer programmers uh, in Western countries in the early 21st century are two of the constituencies that have done the best job for creating privacy for themselves and people like them. Uh, but they may not look very much like the people for whom the consequences of inappropriate social or corporate or societal control are going to do the most harm. Those may be people living in authoritarian countries, those may be people in abusive relationships, it may be uh, poor young men of color in, on the streets of the United States, and the, the places where that impact is happening may not at all be the, the places where the technology is available to protect them. You know, one regret that I have is working at EFF, we were able to do quite a lot for for privacy on the web because we had a constituency of uh, empowered technologists who, who understood the web and could change it. But we weren't able to do very much about mobile phones and, and probably mobile phones were the place where over-policing um, of, and the war on drugs and other impositions on minority communities in the US were probably having the most um, privacy amplified harm. Um, second, version of this uncorrelation can exist. We can have a lot of sort of built up privacy resistance um, that gets in the way of doing things with, uh, with software and with data that actually would probably be a better idea. Often privacy turns into, on the inside of a giant organization, a huge amount of red tape to complicate everything. So to wrap up, a privacy enhancing technology is going to save the world. They're going to give us a way to, to have the web, to have smartphones, to have AI, and yet not regret the privacy hangover that we, we wake up with afterwards? And I think the answer is squarely maybe. There are lots of privacy enhancing systems you can build that are cool gadgets, but don't fundamentally deliver the privacy that people need in the places and times that they need it. However, there, there's a category of things that we can do that affect everyone in a constructive way that make the defaults more sensibly private and protected, that, that stop surveillance, that stop uh, non-consensual collection of data, that uh, give people more control of, over how technology shapes their lives. And there are also ways in which the incentives, incentives can line up because by building this technology and building it the right way, we can make a whole lot of new avenues of development possible. With that, I'd like to wrap. Uh, I don't know if there'll be a chance to take questions, hopefully yes, but either way, uh, really looking forward to the next uh, couple of days of conversations about how we build the right kinds of privacy that protect everyone, but also make uh, a more extraordinary and constructive world possible.